Hoş geldiniz. Şimdi öğleden sonraki e, konuşmacılara e, zaman ayıracağız. E, i̇lk konuşmacımız Hollanda'dan Con Oltus. Şimdi e, Oltus'u e, birkaç ilginç bir şekilde tanıyacağız. Bir kere çılgın projeden bahsedecek. Ama kendi yaptıkları zaten çılgın projeler. Mimar olarak bir sürü kavramı ortaya koymuş. Yüzen şehirlerden bahsetmiş. Şimdi bu kadar ilginç bir kavrama gelince de her yerde ses getiriyor. Time dergisi 2007'de 122. en önemli, en etkin insanlardan birisi olarak seçmiş. Şimdi çok ilginç. Bir görmemiz lazım. Nasıl böylesine ilginç, bu kadar etkinliğe açık yeni düşünceleri birleştiren ortaya koyan birisi İstanbul'a yeni bir temiz hava getirebilir. Burada da tekrar soracağım sorular şunlar. Siz hangi taşın altına elinizi koyacaksınız? Bu düşünceleri nasıl dağıtacağız? Ne kadar çok insana götüreceğiz? Ve bu düşünce aslında çok ilginç ama aynı zamanda tam böyle kontroversiyel bir şey. Siz neler düşünüyorsunuz? Sonuçta ne kadar İyi fikir ya da kötü fikir. Bunları tartışacağız. Ben fazla zamanınızı almadan hemen konu oltuyusu davet edeceğim. Thank you. I didn't uh, understand a word, but it sound very friendly. Um, today I want to tell you a story about float. A float stands for flexible land on aquatic territory. It's a story about things we're doing for the last 10 years. Have you ever noticed that there's such a tension between the way we build our cities and the way we use our cities? We built our cities exactly the same as we did 500 years ago. Static components placed in a rigid city grid. And the question is, why do we build so static? Because our components, our houses, our infrastructure have a lifespan of more than 50 years. And when we've just built them, then they satisfy our needs. But our needs change constantly. And um, in fact, we are part of a dynamic community. And our needs changed even faster in the last decade. Because of all the impact of social changes, demographical changes, climate changes, political changes, the world around us gets more complicated. And it's much more difficult for us to see, to, uh, to, to predict how the city of tomorrow would look like. And if a building doesn't satisfy our needs anymore, we are doomed to demolish it. And of course, this is not very sustainable, because these buildings have most of the time a technical lifespan that's much longer than the, the time that we use it. So I th was thinking and I was triggered by the idea that uh, the world seems to be stuck in this perception that we can only build a city from static components. And I was thinking how cool would it be if our cities were flexible, that we could just shove, shuffle parts away and make space for new functions and instant solutions, solutions at the moment that we need it. But of course, to be as flexible as a shuffle puzzle, We need space. So the big question is, for us and for all urban designers and, and architects worldwide for the last 100 years, where can we find space? And a good example of where you can find space is, for instance, the elevator. If Mr. Otis had not inv uh, invented the elevator, then the cities would still be very flat. But because of the elevator, we could now build cities up to 20, 40, 100 stories high. So this opened up the roof to a vertical city. Well, this search for space is also, in my country, Holland, an uh, essential uh, uh, search. We have, uh, we're living in an uh, artificial country, which has to be pumped dry 24 hours a day, because we are on the sea level. And if we don't pump away this water, then our country would look totally different. Here you see a windmill, and the windmills in the ancient times take water from the, the, this low zone into just behind there, you see some houseboats, into the water. And if you don't pump the water away, then Holland will be wet within a few weeks. 
And the strange thing in Holland is that we making um, a dry a wetland into dry land, but we don't use the space on the water itself. So when my company 10 years ago started by using this space, people said, ah, you must be crazy because only poor people want to live on top of the water. But we started to design all these kinds of new concepts and new ideas. And slowly people started to see, okay, maybe it's, it can work. Maybe you can live on top of water. And I think one of the biggest um, uh, things we find out is that this is not only for Holland. It's not that we are the lucky Dutch. But because this water you can find anywhere. You can find it in Hong Kong, New York, Shanghai. All the cities have this water. Lakes, rivers, seafront. And uh, I think that's, that's easy. So the question is, if you have this water, how do you make a city float? How do you make use of this water? Well, in the last few hundred years, cities around the world have been using uh, landfill to make their island or their land bigger. These are pictures of Manhattan from 1650 up to 1990. And you see that Manhattan has been growing for more than uh, 40%. That's all by putting sand into the water. And these landfill projects, they, um, they destroy a lot. This is a project in uh, Dubai, which is uh, called the World. And they make a complete land ma um, uh, map of, of uh, islands. And the sand totally destroys underwater life. And we think that it can be done in another way by floating land. And floating land is just floating foundations on which you can put on top exactly the same as you can do on land. Same houses, same infrastructure, only the foundation is different. Ah, here it is. Oh. And the beauty about doing uh, floating developments and floating land is that it is scarless. It doesn't leave any scars. So after 100 years or 150 years, you can take the floating development, take it away, and there is no scars on the, on the ground. There are only some cables who are connected to the ground or some uh, telescopic piles that make it a vertical movement of the island uh, possible. And the beauty is that we can build those floating houses and floating islands in factories. And you can bring them over the water to your uh, destination where you need it. That means you can also build um, without any uh, damage to the water. There is no emission to the water. You can do it in a controlled environment. These floating foundations can be very small, but they also can be very large. And we make them of foam and concrete. And the foam, the white stuff you see, is exactly the same that you have uh, when you buy a new television. You have this, this white foam around it. Well, that foam we use, and we have concrete to make it rigid. And on top of these uh, foundations, you can build just normal houses. And they are exactly under the same regulations in Holland as they are on, uh, uh, on land. And this is the same house from the other side. And this house was on national television. And um, some of my friends, he, he called me and he said, Kuhn, you must be very disappointed because on television nobody mentioned that it was a floating foundation. But I think I'm, uh, we are very lucky that they didn't, because that's exactly what we want. We want to make exactly the same houses with the same price and the same comfort. And it's not about a floating thing. It's just a technical solution to, to build on places where before you couldn't build. Well, with the foundations, we can start making floating neighborhoods. And they can be as large as a complete uh, block with 200 by 200 square meters, with roads on top of it, with houses on top of it, with green on top of it. And all infrastructure is already in these floating foundations. So it's a plug and play system. You can just connect it to the existing grid. And slowly you can let it grow to a complete hydro city. But even after 100 years when you take it away, you can just go back. So it's, it's very dynamical and very flexible. How safe is it on the water? Well, I'm very happy to be here in, uh, in uh, Istanbul, and because of course you have here the, the, also the earthquake um, uh, danger. But first, let's talk about tsunami. Um, for a tsunami, if you're on the water, then a tsunami is only a little wave of half a meter to a meter. There are stories of the people uh, in 2004 that are before the coast of Thailand, fishermen, 
that they didn't even feel the tsunami. It's only when the wave comes to land, then it builds up and destroys everything. And also with the earthquake, uh, water is the best shock absorber that you can have, because the ground can go up and down, but the, the, the, the, the building on the water will just uh, stay at the same location. Hurricanes the same. At the energy absorbed by the, the wind can be uh, put from the house towards the water. So now that we know where to build, and we know that it's safe, and we know how to build, now how can this satisfy our changing needs? Because we are talking about cities and that they have changing needs. Well, um, I like to make a comparison between uh, an element you all know, the smartphone, and the city. I think most of you have a smartphone, but I'm also very sure that they are not the same. They look maybe the same, but they are not the same because you have added all your own apps to it. And those apps satisfy exactly your own needs. So the apps are different than a year ago and will be different than in two years time because your personal needs change constantly. So I'm thinking, why can't a city work exactly the same like that? Why can't you have a hardware structure on which you can just add so-called city apps, floating urban components with special functions that you can just um, click and add to your city. And the functions of these uh, so-called city apps can be very diverse. It's not only housing, it can also be green, and um, uh, towers, offices, boulevard, a floating beach, which is possible, Rotating towers, of course you have to eat, solar fields, a floating forest, hotels, almost anything you can think of which you can build on land, you also can build on the water, as long as your water is deep enough. So think of these possibilities. Eh? When you have a need of housing, you can just tow in a complete floating apartment complex. This is designed for a floating apartment complex we are building in Holland. It must be finished in uh, three years. We have now just uh, opened the area which will, will it come. And we built it on location and then we let the water in and it starts to be a floating uh, apartment. And the beauty about these ideas is the aquanomics. It gives a possibility for new economic uh, opportunities. Because now a city um, a municipality, they don't have to buy uh, these elements anymore. They can lease it. So instead of spending their complete budget on, on projects on land, they can do now parts of these projects on, on, on water and lease those big buildings from big developers worldwide who build those functions on stock. And if you think about that, those ideas, then you can think also about the Olympics. How strange is it that each four years a new city starts building stadiums, building infrastructure, building media facilities, sporting facilities, and then after, for, after the games, that only lasts for four weeks, then they're not used anymore. Well, now we can have some functions on floating foundations, and like a floating circus, bring them from one city to another city, that's really sustainable. Then you can really reuse it for the, the total technical lifespan. So where can we see these city apps for real? Because they sound fantastic, but are we already doing these ideas? Well, we have found a, found a perfect space to, to, uh, to show these first examples, and that's the Maldives. And as you know, the Maldives is a very low-laying country, only one meter fifty above sea level, just underneath India and uh, they're threatened by sea level rise. They think that if water will rise for a meter to two meters in the next 25 to, to 100 years, then there will not be any Maldives anymore. Even on this moment, there is... Uh, oh. On this moment, um, there are only 200 of the islands that are above the water, of the 1,200 islands in total. That means, you can say, that already 80% of the Maldives is underneath the water. But the good thing is that the bad thing of the Maldives is underneath the water. It's the coral reef, and uh, people go there to, uh, to spend a holiday. But they have also a lack of space. And 
The project we do now is a project of 43 floating islands. Of course, this project is for the, the, the, the, the high-end market, very rich people out uh, from, from China and from India and from Russia. But you can just build your own floating island. Um, again, it's made of, of foam and concrete, and you can place your house on top of it, and you have all this green, natural green around it. And the beauty is, is that you also can enter your house with a floating submarine. We have to, this uh, is a submarine that's built in Holland. It's like six meters lo uh, long. And imagine that you're sitting with all your friends in your house on your island. And you push the button, and the floor opens, and then the submarine comes up. Now, this is just James Bond, but we're actually doing it. And even a bigger project is an 18-hole floating golf course, also for the Maldives. The Maldives, um, uh, if you go on holiday there, or you go on honeymoon there, uh, that is, that's fantastic, but the only thing you can do is snorkel around and laying in the sun. So uh, we have now doing this project, which is a combination of 32 floating islands with the golf course on top of it, and some of the islands are connected with um, tunnels underneath, glass tunnels. So you go with your golf cart in the tunnel, and you have this big aquarium around you, and then you come back to the other island, uh, to the other side. Um, this project has to be finished in uh, three years' time now. And there's already the development agreement, there are already the licenses. So this project is really going uh, to, to, to work. Um, and of course, these projects are a lot of fun. And they, um, they give a lot of fun for us as architects. But I think they are not really uh, solving a lot of uh, problems. And the biggest problems we have on this moment is urbanization. If you see to these development countries uh, like, like, like India and Bangladesh, then um, they need also new solutions. Because these um, the countries in development, you see that the people who come to that city, they are living in what we call slums, in places that are close to the water, that are very vulnerable for floodings, and um, they are unplanned. You can't not really predict where they will come. You only know that they will be in, in, in wet zones. So if you see the quality of these houses and how those people live, and that they have a lack of energy, a lack of uh, water, a lack of um, uh, shelter, then it would be very fun, or very good, if we could use city apps, floating urban components, to help in these kind of uh, places. And many people think that slums are only a temporary problem, but we know for sure that slums are there to stay, because the problem is only getting bigger in the next uh, uh, 50 years. In uh, 2050, 70% of the people will live in cities, and there is no space, because the, the, the degree of spatial freedom in those cities is getting smaller and smaller. So, now we come to the real um, function of city apps. Because city apps have all the ingredients to help those slums. They are catalyst functions, and they could really kickstart the process of upgrading such a slum. The, uh, we, we need space to do that. Well, city apps you can place on top of the water, and all those slums are next to the water. So it makes sense that you can just place it there. You need investors. Well, the beauty is that investors you can search by um, local politicians. Because politicians, they need those people in those slums. Because if you look at Mumbai, Mumbai, Mumbai there are 60% um, of people are living in slums, and they are all uh, voters. So if you can get that electoral um, uh, group connected to you by putting some of the city apps by upgrading their neighborhood, that makes sense too. And the other thing is flexibility. You need flexibility, because upgrading of a slum, you do that in steps. And each next step, you need different functions. And water provides those flexibility. You can take in and out those functions. So the first step we have to do is we have to bring shelter, water, energy, and food. And if you um, uh, think about the ideas of having floating shelter in those slums, which provide instant um, uh, functions, instant upgrade of, uh, of shelter. And the beauty is, with, with a uh, flooding coming, the house will just rise and go back, so there is no damage. 
Or if you think about sanitation, sanitation in these kind of, of slums is uh, very bad. And if you can just control the outflow of black water through those uh, filters, which can be city apps connected to, the, uh, to, to those areas, we could control a bit better the, the, the water quality. Energy. The, the plans uh, we did for the Maldives, we came with floating solar blanket fields. There's a big uh, floating um, uh, solar cells that just just on top of the water, and the, the water will just go over it constantly, and they just uh, blend in with, with, with the color of the water, and you can just add them to your city, or you can add them to your uh, slum by making them less um, uh, depending on energy from outside. People who are living in slums, for instance in uh, Bangladesh, in, uh, in Dhaka, they spend one third of their money in energy and in water. And if we can provide them with um, a cheaper energy and cheaper clean water, they can spend that other kind of money in upgrading their homes. So it's, it's, it's a mix of, of, uh, of functions and solutions. We are thinking about ideas of micro-lease. That means that big NGOs are not spending money just into such a neighborhood, but they're spending it in city apps. And the neighborhoods can start leasing for a very small amount of money these kind of functions. So it totally re, um, um, changes the way the economic system works in these neighborhoods. What about floating agriculture? If you can make a floating golf course, then it's easily uh, easy uh, the same to, same, to use the same technology to make floating agriculture in those, uh, in those slums. I must say this picture looks a bit, if it's a big holiday camp, but uh, in fact it's a slum. So I think that uh, city apps are the starting point for building for change. And building for change is what we should do to make the world a little bit more sustainable. So the question is then, how strange are city apps for uh, Istanbul. I was, uh, I was, I've never been here, it's the first time for me in Istanbul. So what you do is you go into Google and Google Maps and you search for some places. And there are a few places that yeah, you might know, I don't know, but are uh, quite interesting. I saw this uh, bridge, which uh, seems to be a floating bridge that can open and close, which is in fact a uh, city app. I, was, uh, I found these islands in the middle of the, of the, of the river, which they, they look beautiful. I don't think they are being used, but if they were like a, a floating islands, they could be perfect city apps. And what about this one? It's a floating um, a swimming pool and a discotheque around it. So um, I see that Istanbul is already uh, using these kind of functions to add um, to the city. This is even uh, also a big one. I don't know if it's still there, but it's, uh, it looks nice. Uh, other functions that are uh, not floating, but are also in the middle of the water. Uh, this, this, uh, this the old, it was a firehouse, I think it was. And of course the mosque. So placing functions next to the water is not strange for, for Istanbul. Um, when I was asked to come to Istanbul, they, um, they sent me some information about the, the Istanbul Kennel Project. And um, they asked me if I could give my opinion towards this project. And this is, of course, uh, very difficult because you don't know all the socio-economical reasoning behind such a project. But it is interesting to see what kind of um, um, good things can come out of such a project. Um, for the people who are not from Istanbul, eh, that this is of course the Bosporus eh, connecting the Black Sea with the Sea of Marmara. And um, there is a lot of pressure on this single passage. If you see, uh, and it's maybe hard to see, but here, hundreds of ships are waiting to pass, and here the same. So it's one of the most busy passages in the world. And there is now a, uh, an idea of the government which is in fact a very old idea. I think it's an idea that's already 600 years old and it's now being reused to make a new passage some part away from Istanbul and to make a new canal in which all the marine traffic can go through. And now we are thinking, what does it mean? What does it mean if you make a new canal? But 
I'm not talking about the canal itself and how beautiful that can be and how beautiful uh, floating developments can be on that uh, second passage, but I want to know what happens with the Bosporus itself, what happens with uh, Istanbul, how can it provide new solutions for Istanbul. So what are the positive effects of the decrease of marine traffic through the Bosporus? Because of the information I got, it says that in, uh, when this project has happened, there will be no marine traffic anymore, no, no big oil tankers through the Bosporus anymore. Well, this provides a lot of uh, opportunities. If you look at, at the uh, decreasing uh, degree of spatial freedom in the center of Istanbul, and you see that in the last uh, uh, two, three hundred years, there is enormous growth of, uh, of, of the city. And it's all around the center. So the spatial freedom in the center itself is getting uh, more and more compact. That has effect on green. That has effect on prices. That has effect on, on, on houses, how compact they are. And then you see this beautiful new building space in the center of the city. Because if there's no marine traffic anymore, you can start using it for building. And uh, the rest of Istanbul is like hills. This is completely flat. You can't do anything with it. So how large is it? So we, we took the Eiffel Tower and just put on top of it, because I know the Eiffel Tower and I don't know the Bosporus. And it's like, like five times the Eiffel Tower next to each other. So that's a lot of space. And um, what we did is we, we tried to make a new concept, a new idea, and uh, that, that gives you an idea from what you could do with your water. It's called the Simply Gates, and it's a concept of floating islands. Um, we try to answer a few of the, the, the, the needs for the city. Um, there is already, uh, of course, a lot of connections between Asia and Europe. And there's also connections over water with the ferries. But the, the possibility, if you have no marine traffic anymore, is you can make that, that uh, an expansion of the connection over water. And uh, uh, make that more uh, intensified. Also, cruise ships that now come to uh, Istanbul without marine traffic, it's possible to have more cruise ships and to even make them more in the center of the Bosporus, where you have the most beautiful view uh, over the city. City expansion over water and places where there is uh, uh, enough space and you don't, uh, not just in front of beautiful houses, you can start making use of that water to build your city on top of it. And uh, what about eco-hubs? Hey, they have some green zones on both sides, on, on, on Asia and Europe. So, um, and the other thing is, is that, of course, you have to safeguard cultural heritage. I think if you really want to do something new to your city, it shouldn't hurt the thing that's already there. And the beauty is by, by dinging, uh, doing things on top of the water, is that it's reversible. So it doesn't affect the things that are on land. And huh, we can do it scarless. It doesn't leave any scars during lifespan. It doesn't leave any scars after lifespan. So it can also bring flexibility to the waterfront. How should it look and where can we start? Now, what we did, we took the, the, the map of the Bosporus and we were in search of locations that had a bad connection to the water. So that means that there were some big roads or there is some industrial zones. And we just marked that on one map. And after that, we started to uh, look for private residential sections. Because, of course, there are the places where you can't do anything. People are now living next to the water, want to stay next to the water, and don't want to have any developments just in front of them. So if you those place those two functions uh, on top of each other, then you can come up with some areas which we call selected areas. And of course, I'm not from Istanbul, so maybe uh, I'm now making somebody very mad that because their houses are there. But um, these are the, the locations where you can start a floating development. Well, we called these ideas the Simply Gades. And there's this beautiful old myth about these moving rocks in the Bosporus. And all the ships in ancient times who want to pass through the, uh, the, the, the Bosporus are clashed by those uh, islands. And they, they make sure that there no, island can, no uh, ship can pass. Well, clashing rocks is for me almost the same as floating islands. Floating islands that crash together. So the name, name Simply Gades, which is something so especially from Bosporus, we use for, for our designs. 
So first, we, say, we think that, that um, we have to find a location for expanding urban fabric. Because if you do something on the water, it should be exactly the same as you do on land. People don't like to really to have floating houses that look completely different. Um, the second step, so first step is expanding urban fabric at the locations. And then the, the next step, when there's no marine traffic anymore, is um, putting city apps as islands in the water. And these islands, those city apps, can be just located all over the water because there are no ships. And hey, you already see the, the idea. Um, you can now start island hopping from Europe to Asia and back. It provides a new kind of, of, of tourism. All the needs for the city in the next year, if we are talking about stadiums, if we are talking about green, if we are talking about housing, can just be added to the city on the water. And it could provide an answer to all these new and unexpected needs that are come. We can provide them with instant solutions. And if you zoom in on a, a part, uh, empty building zone, as we see it in the center of the city, you can see how it works. I think the, the, the first step will be expansion over the water. And you see those blocks? They have a little bit of this feeling of Venice, where you can go with your boats in between. And the next step will be that we have these floating islands with green on top of it. And they can be relocated through time. Even a floating harbor for cruise ships can be added. And slowly you can see that it grows into a dynamic hydro city. It's not that it has to be exactly like this, but this provides just an opportunity just in front of, uh, of the city. And um, well, maybe it would look like this, that you have these this green islands we're not talking about architecture here. We're just talking about the idea of having this function in the middle, in the middle which means you can hop from island to island. And those green islands, they provide another function because green islands can be the eco-hub from one side to another side. And those floating islands uh, provide uh, the possibility of connecting those zones. And then we're talking about little birds. We're talking about uh, sea animals. So then the question is, how difficult is it to make a floating island? And uh, there was already this other gentleman talking about these pet flashes. Well, this is a story that is also as, as nice as that. It's about an Englishman who's called uh, Richie Sowa. And he went from England to Mexico. And he was like a hippie. And he was living on the beach. And he was collecting all these pet flashes that were on the, on the beach. And he put them together in nets. And then he noticed that those nets were floating. So he connected all those nets together and started putting sand on top of it. And very slowly, he made his own island. And he put some green on it, some mangroves. And through time, it started to grow and started to be a green island. And when the time it was finished, there was, it was this really, really large floating green island. He had some ducks on it and some chicken and a dog. And then in the end, there was a big storm and the island was just put on, on the land, but for a few years there was this first floating island of, the mall of, the, of Mexico, completely natural and very easy to build. Um, of course we are architects, so we always try to do a little bit more difficult. I don't know if it's necessary, but uh, what about a sea tree? A sea tree can be an answer for decreasing ecology um, uh, around your city. So um, is that difficult technology? No look upon the existing offshore technology in the world. The oil companies who are making these big oil platforms and being uh, brought from one location to another location all over the world. So um, if we can convince those oil companies to give us the technology and pay for those sea trees and we can convince the city to give us a place, then we can start to implement an instant habitat for improving, improving ecology. Fishes, birds, uh, animals, all connected to this uh, sea tree. Inside it should be hollow, so all the water of the rain will be collected in this kind of vase uh, for bats and bees and birds. And on the water it can be a habitat for, for fishes, because they don't have not so much space in, this, uh, in the Bosporus to, uh, to connect. And um, to make it, it's, it's not that difficult. And depending on the depth of the water, you can make them higher and lower. And they even can move a little bit along with, uh, with the wind and with the water. And it would be architecture only for flora and fauna, so not for human. The ecological effect 
on land from the sea tree uh, is, is, is large. You can place it on the water, but the effect of the birds and bees go much further. It goes to 500 to a kilometer, is what ecologists say. And of course, one tree is only a symbol. And many of trees can change uh, completely the way this uh, Bosporus functions. I just want to finish with this last uh, uh, image, which uh, I think um, now provides an idea of how we can use uh, the floating islands for the Bosporus. Thank you very much. Sizin bir sürü sorunuz vardır. Ama ben bir tane, bir iki tane size sorayım. Ondan sonra siz sormaya başlayın. Uh, let me say it in English so he will hear it in English then I will translate it in to Turkish. Uh, did you know that the, one of the first floating islands here was built by Persians back in 600 BC to put all the boats from Anadolu where you see Anadolu Hisarı to Rumeli Hisarı now so they can allow the Persian army to go from Asian side to European side. Dediğim şu, yaklaşık 600 milattan önce 600'lerde ilk floating bu yüzen şehir aslında e, Perslerin gemilerinden yapılmış. Darius'un ordusunu Anadolu'dan As e, Avrupa yakasına taşımak için. O yaklaşık olarak şimdiki ikinci köprünün olduğu yerde Anadolu Hisarı'ndan e, Rumeli Hisarı'na gelen yere kadar bütün gemiler yan yana park etmiş. Orada işte bir birkaç yıl boyunca sürekli olarak oraya e, askerleri taşımışlar. Ondan sonra da daha bir sürü örnekleri var zaten biliyorsunuz. Ama benim burada gördüğüm bir şey var. Bir söylediği için de bir konvins etsek dedi. Mesela e, bu e, e, petrol şirketlerini konvins etsek de oradaki bu yüzen kuleleri alsalar, petrol arama e, kulelerini alıp bir şekilde şehirlere uygulamayı düşünseler, şehirleri de konvins etsek de onları alsalar dediler. O konvins etmenin arkasında ben bir tek şey görüyorum. Para. O yüzden soracağım soru olacak şimdi. So, uh, the question is this. You mentioned at some point about convincing the oil companies to use their platforms and adapt them to cities. So that convincing part, vice versa, from cities to the uh, oil companies, the only um, drawback or the obstacle to overcome is the money. So what do you think about the economic prospect of doing something like that? Um, why we are looking uh, at oil companies, because oil companies have this very bad imago. Uh, you have seen uh, British Petroleum, uh, this big disaster, uh, I think, near, near Mexico, or near the United States. And um, we want to show them that with their technology and with their money, they can also do very good things. Only uh, don't go advertising Formula One, but just advertise by building a sea tree because it's their technology, it's their money, it's only location from the city we need, and it can be a perfect match. So, I want to come back to your other thing you said about the, the Persians and having this, this uh, floating island. I think it's very clear to say that we were by far not the first who were doing these floating developments. Even uh, 50 years ago, there were these beautiful floating plans for Tokyo, expanding a city over water. The only thing is that we, on this time, there's momentum with our technology today and with urbanization, it now all makes sense. So I think this is really the starting point of having floating developments all over the world. Not 20 years ago, not within 20 years, but just today. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from, and uh, soru var mı başka? There's one at the corner. Yeah. Uh, don't you think that uh, covering the surface of the water, uh, you are, are you going to consider the bottom of the sea? Because it's not dead uh, or it's not uh, empty there. When you cover it uh, from sunshine, etc., it will be the same damage that we do on land, uh, building over uh, land um, where we can do other things there. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, this question we get a lot, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, what we do with each project, we make a fingerprint. We look at the location, how deep is the water, how much flow of water do you have, what is the, the, the material of the soil. And then we can exactly measure 
how much of a development we can put on top of the water. And sometimes the shade of these uh, islands can be bad, and then we don't make the islands, or we make the islands smaller, or make holes in, in it to, make, to allow the sun to hit the soil. And um, uh, on other uh, moments, it's always also good to have floating islands because little fish and all can just go underneath it. So you create a new habitat. But each time when we do a development worldwide, we do an um, uh, environmental uh, assessment study. So we know exactly what we can do and what we can't do. So yes. Beyond the images. Um, I, yeah, I want to ask you about the difference between the possibility of making an environmental assessment, which I totally trust that you have the plans for such a thing, and what actually happens when development gets out of control, so that the whole of the Florida Everglades have been effectively destroyed by development driven by waterside property values over a 60, 70 year period, in which people knew on day one that there would be environmental costs to pay, but the logic of the property market was stronger than the environmental logic. And the same thing is happening today in energy and solar energy, is that you're having plans for these gigantic so-called solar farms that are being put on what people describe as empty or dead space, such as a desert, except that when you look a bit more closely at this space, it's not empty or dead. Deserts contain all sorts of ecosystems, social and natural. And the trouble is that the power of our thirst for energy is stronger than any environmental audit or kind of checklist that can be done. So I don't argue with you that there is a logic for property to be developed in Istanbul as in other cities. What I question is whether any kind of environmental safeguards will survive the development process. So, uh, the, the beauty about uh, floating developments, uh, of course, everything you do on water has an effect. And of course, we can do all this assessment to say that it, it doesn't hurt anything. But the beauty about things doing on water, that is flexible. So if people see, if uh, the community see that things go wrong, that has a negative effect, you can or reverse it, or change it, or adapt it. And that makes it, uh, I think, uh, the ideal way to, to use space. Um, I would like to <clears throat> ask you your definition of sustainability, because um, in your presentation, all the concepts, all the ideas, I try to make a link between the concept of sustainability and all the everything in your presentation, and I couldn't make any uh, relation to sustainability. So I think maybe our definitions of sustainability are different. I wonder. I think there are, there are many uh, uh, ways to look upon sustainability. The way we do it is that um, uh, instead of, of, of people looking at this cradle-to-cradle -cradle ideas, eh, we have a, a building and you can destroy it back to the, the, the essential materials and rebuild it. I, for me, sustainability means that I want to use products and buildings for the complete lifespan. Because if I make a very good, very sustainable building and I only use it for 20 years, and it could last for 100 years and then they destroy it, I think that is less sustainable than making a floating building that I can use for the complete 100 years on different locations uh, and, and then make it of material that maybe are a little bit less sustainable. So um, it's a mix. And for me, sustainability is using everything for the complete lifespan. Son bir soru da alacağız. Bir kişi daha var orada. Evet. Then, didn't you think that this, uh, your perspective, encourage an unsustainable uh, construction growth system? It doesn't encourage. Or, do you think that it uh, gives a barrier, or it's an encouragement for this kind of industry and construction business? I, I hope that it will uh, encourage uh, uh, construction uh, companies to, to re rethink uh, their their projects. Um, we think that that. Again, on water, there are so much more possibilities to do things sustainable, to do things as we call scarless. So I think that, um, uh, yes, it would be a good thing that uh, construction companies look upon the, the, the possibility to, uh, to use this kind of functions. I hope I answered your question. Yeah.
Asla e, burada duracağız. Evet. Teşekkürler. Thank you very much. Ee, I'll take you there and invite the two other speakers. <gülüyor> Teşekkürler. Konu.